This video is on the failure of the sideband filter crystals in the Drake TR3 and TR4 and how to test the filters as a whole to determine if the filters failed. Drake buffs know that it's essentially the same filter failing all the time. It's always quote unquote the upper sideband filter. There's no engineering reason for that as far as drive levels, uh, vibration, humidity, yada 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 except for temperature. The, the two filters are identical design, same kind of crystals, they're only off in frequency by a few kc from each other, from filter to filter. With the very kind help of someone from Network Sciences who either developed or was in the company back when these were developed, I was told that these crystals are damaged by heat. Crystals are very sensitive to, to heat. Drake, in their infinite wisdom, made a serious design mistake when they first did the design of these radios in layout. They didn't put the power supply components where they should be. They put two 10 watt sandstone resistors for the 150 volt power supplies right behind the sideband filters. In a TR3, in this radio, those two resistors were under the chassis where the heat can float up along the chassis and up against the filters. In the TR4, they put them on top of the chassis, and just so happens in my TR4 here, the resistors are behind the filter that failed. And we tend to, to prop these radios up. You see this one on a piece of wood to make it easier to see the front panel. That just helps the heat draft up against the sideband filters. So takeaway there is, if they're not already ruined, turn the thing off and move those two resistors any place but there they should have been back in the back of the radio. All the power supply stuff should be back in the back. But it's easy to paint power supply in a design corner and end up with mistakes like that. And they really couldn't foresee that happening 40 years down the road. Okay, so it's, it's got a bad filter, or we suspect it does. How do we know? Testing is important. The best easiest overall test is to build a, uh, a fixture like this. This is a microphone plug for the TR3 with a switch on for push to talk and a two male RCAs into a two RCA and a, and a phone jack to plug in the computer into the audio card output of the computer and I have made up a uh, a software file that sweeps an audio signal from 10 cycles to 3 kc. That's beyond the bandwidth of the filters. Dump that through a dropping resistor network into the mic input for a proper mic level and that sweeps the entire transmitter chain out the back to a dummy load and connecting the oscilloscope that can withstand 300 volts RF to, uh, to the dummy load and directly read the transmit signal. And what that gives is an envelope like this. Now that's testing the entire transmitter chain, but predominantly it's displaying the shape of the pass band of the sideband filter. It's a that's the easiest boundary test, if you will, without taking the radio apart. But if you're looking strictly for the response of the filter, it has to be taken out and tested separately. But for a functional test, this is very good because it, it will also catch defects in the rest of the transmitter. That takes a little bit of doing. There's an easier way yet. Not nearly as accurate, maybe. It's a bit subjective, but it works very well. And that is to put the receiver on any low band. This is on 40. Put the marker generator on with a cow switch. Maybe you can hear it humming in the background. There it comes. Very, very, very strong signal. And there goes the box. Extremely strong signal. Too strong. So, knock that signal amplitude down to about an S5 with the RF tune control. That reminds us of one of the procedures, the alignment procedures in the manual, of setting the uh, the 
filter cans. I'm going to drop that amplitude down. And I'll go down here to zero beat. There's about a about a 5S unit indication. And as I tune up in frequency, watch the S meter. At the high frequency, going backwards, a big jump up to, I don't know, S7. Down a bit, going down, down a bit, down a bit coming back up a bit and dropping fairly sharply near zero beat. It may not be quite obvious but that is also displaying the shape of the pass band of the filter. As we would see if we started at one side at one frequency or the other low or high and swept across this waveform. If you recall the two peaks in the S meter reading, that's these. The disturbing thing about this filter response is that it drops off extremely quickly at high frequencies and not low. We need the, the very fast roll off down here where the carrier is. That filters backwards. But Lord help anyone who tries to fix that. <laughs> it's not easy. But in detail, <clears throat> if we start and slowly tune and maybe mark down the S meter readings, maybe give a little more amplitude and slowly go up. We could make a, 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 a chart, a graph, by recording the S meter readings as that's increased. But that doesn't give us any way to correlate that to the filter pass band exactly. The graph on the computer is correlated because I know the sweep frequency, but here we don't have that reference. So the thing to do there is to put a frequency counter on the speaker, which is a very accurate indication of audio frequency. Then as the receiver comes off zero beat and an audio tone is produced, the counter will indicate the frequency. <coughs> and the counter data can be used to indicate where the peaks are. So that's a very useful uh, external test to determine if the filters are good or not.